Hello everybody, welcome to the third English primary webinar for British schools in the Middle East. Uh, my name is Carla Ainsco and I'm currently the head of year one, her, year three, sorry, at um, Suffolk Community School. Uh, with me I have my colleague Fanula. Hi, um, so I also work along Carla and I, I lead English in Safa as well. So today's webinar is titled Curriculum Integration Across the Primary Phase um, and we are delighted to welcome our speakers today. We have got Kate Shelley and we also have the lovely Jacqueline Harmer from Fieldwood Education. Um, so Kate Shelley is from Tales Toolkit and she's got several years experience and achievements under her belt including a Teach First Award, a Gold Award for Prime Areas and literacy. Um, Kate will be sharing with us how storytelling impacts learning across a curriculum, including integrated storytelling through different subjects. Um, if you have any questions, please share them in the questions and comments in the chat bar. Myself and Fee will monitor you throughout the sessions and we'll have a questions and answers session at the end of the webinar for the speakers. Please remember this webinar is recorded so it can be referred to at any point and please do share this with your colleagues. So I'm gonna hand over to you, Kate, and hope everyone enjoys. Over to you, Kate. Kate, I think you're on mute. I was just say, can you see my screen okay? Yes? Lovely. Okay. Um, so really pleased to be here today um, and happy to speak to you. Um, and we've got a number of schools linked with the British schools in the Middle East using Tales Toolkit already. And it's it's really exciting to be able to come and speak to more of you. So I just wanted to start by saying I am a teacher. My background is in teaching. Um, like I run Tales Toolkit and that's my business now. But um, I started as a teacher, worked as a deputy head, and I've worked in lots of different settings. My background is mainly in early years, but just to say that I do know where you're coming from and massive respect to all of you, especially this year. I, I can imagine it's just been crazy, but I do know how hard teachers work. So um, I can kind of understand and think about where you're coming from. Um, and when I was working in schools in London, I worked in East London in some of the areas with very high numbers of children with EAL and lots of deprivation. Um, we saw a huge gap in terms of the children coming into school. And there were a number of areas that were really key for us that stood out as being a huge problem that underpinned everything. And those were language, social skills and creativity. And for us, it's something that I've concentrated on when I've developed Health Toolkit. And when I started creating Tales Toolkit in school, we were really curious about what was going on in these areas and we found that Tales Toolkit resources, which I'm going to explain a little bit more later on, were making a huge difference for those children in those particular areas, which was then underpinning and going through into all of the other areas of learning. Um, and I was lucky enough, um, as was mentioned before, to win the Teach First Innovation Award in 2015-16. And that gave me lots of time. They helped me out. They kind of gave me funding to come out of teaching and to start the business up. And I was able to really kind of look into and research all of the background stuff that was going on for children. And one of the big things that came out that underpinned everything in terms of every area of the curriculum, everything that children do. I mean, it's massively important, particularly in early years, but all the way across children's kind of education really is the quality of the interactions that they have. And that was what came through was that it was about those kind of interactions that children were having with their family, with teachers, with their friends, the confidence they were building, the language they were building. And it was those interactions that underpinned everything. So in terms of the learning right across curriculum that's what we've got to get right first for those children and what we do is we do that through storytelling but it's not just about words and it's not just about that language and back and forth and um, this is a communication tree that a lot of speech and languages therapists here use um, and right at the roots before you get that conversation and social interaction at the top of here and you get your speech sounds and fluency coming through you've got play, you've got social motivation, and you've got attention and listening right at the roots of those three. So um, for children that you're working with, 
whatever topic, whatever kind of area of the curriculum we're working on, you've got to get those areas right first. And you've got to make sure that you're providing children with lots and lots of play, lots of opportunity for them to explore and ask questions and really kind of working on that attention, that listening and that social motivation. So it's building those bonds with those children and making sure you've got that relationship first. And this year, I mean, it's been a very strange and upsetting year for a lot of people. Um, with COVID, children are spending a lot more time inside. They're spending a lot more time in front of screens. And there was some research that was done before COVID even was a, something that we knew as a name, where they found that the average seven-year-old, by the time um, they're seven, they've watched a full year of 24 hour of screen time. So screen time is huge for a lot of our children. And this year, you're going to have a huge gap in terms of the difference for children, because you might have one child that's coming into school after all this is over where they've had parents that are interacting and talking and playing and spending lots of time with them and on the other side you might have parents that are struggling because they're homeschooling and they're doing their full-time job at home and they're trying to manage everything and they're not getting that time and children in front of screens and they're not getting that talk and that back and forth and spending time with the teachers and other family members so for us right now it's really important that we get this right and put those core things in place to impact learning right across the curriculum. So what's our solution? Just a little bit about Tales Toolkit. Um, so we work with story and there's lots of research to show that story can impact right across the curriculum and in lots of different areas and lots of different skills. So for children's social skills, um, it makes a difference in terms of maths. So there was a study that was done that found that children that learn story structure in early years um, and your kind of early primary um, went on to do better in maths at GCSE level. So there's lots of connections with maths and problem solving and story um, in terms of creative thinking, in terms of literacy, it's huge, um, in terms of speech and language, and also in terms of all cognitive types of thinking. So story is huge, but even bigger than that, and what we work with is storytelling. So you'll kind of think about the power of reading a book with a child and sharing a story book with a child. But when you're working on a level where you're creating your own stories and you're using your imagination, that then really kind of ups that learning to another level again. So that's what we do with Tells Toolkit. So the way that we work is we have four symbols. So we have character, setting, problem, solution, and they're on lots and lots of different kits. And we use those as kind of pegs to be able to create stories with. And what we then do is you can put things in the bags, put things in the stories that the children will resonate and understand and link with. So it can be anything from um, a picture of their home. Um, I've got some things here. So it can be things like favorite toys, superheroes, characters that they really respond to. Um, it can be pictures of mum, it could be pictures of themselves. Um, we do lots of work with open-ended items, so you can put in a stick, which can be anything. Um, and also we make lots of links with core books. So if you're doing the Little Red Hen or the Gruffalo, you can then use those things for children to be able to create their own stories. So there's lots of things you can use with children. Um, here's just a picture of the kit that we have. So we have lots of different bags and aprons and pockets, and all of those use the same four symbols. And what we find is that by using the symbols, which we've created and we've put a lot of time and thought into, um, you've got children that haven't got English, children that haven't got those kind of language levels, children with special educational needs. So we have a lot of impact for children with autism and for children with learning difficulties. So those symbols can kind of click into place with children as young as two um, and then really kind of support them in remembering that structure and working with that. And here's just some pictures of children using those kits, kind of finding things around the setting and creating stories. Um, and then also we have lots of different writing resources. So once children are familiar with storytelling, and that's really important to us that they have the language and the communication first before they move on to the writing, then there's lots of different resources that will get the children writing then and making their own stories and creating them and telling them and writing them down. And I've got a few pictures to show you with that. So here's some kind of big, kind of younger down the school kind of images and then kind of going up. Um, so we've been really lucky um, over the past kind of couple of years, maybe a bit longer now, actually, um, we've been working with Goldsmiths University of London and they've been tracking the impact of Tales Toolkit. And what they found is there's been an impact made for schools that are using Tales Toolkit um, in a number of different areas. And here's just a few of them. So um, personal, social, emotional development, expressive arts and design, um, communication and language, um, literacy and understanding the world. 
And um, you can see on these kind of lines the difference between the schools using TELS toolkit and also those comparison schools and the difference that's been made. Um, and also we found that in terms of children's literacy, um, we closed the gender gap. So um, I know that a lot of schools have an issue with boys writing. So for us, we closed that gap in terms of the boys writing um, by, let's have a look, click here so you can see it here, 62%. And the schools that didn't use TELS Toolkit, the gap got wider by 22%. So that was kind of something that we had a lot of publicity about at the time. And I think in terms of that, it's really about the enthusiasm and it's about those boys having a story that they want to tell and then having an opportunity with things that they're interested in and that they're motivated to talk about that's then gone on to kind of push them to be able to want to write about it. So <clears throat> I know that today it's kind of all about across the curriculum. So I just wanted to touch briefly on kind of how Tells Toolkit can fit in with different things, but then I wanted to talk more about some of those skills and the way that they kind of underbed everything that's going to come really in terms of their learning. So tell to be used with everything. So we've had, you've got here Chinese New Year, we've had live animals go in bags. So you've had children that have made their own woodwork characters to put in stories. This is the story of um, uh, bonfire night when we were doing bonfire night. Um, so you can use absolutely anything like we do stuff with maths where you put in like a calculator in the solution bag or you can put in scales um, and we talk about kind of maths language in terms of bigger and smaller and higher and lower and kind of problems around science so you can put in magnifying glasses and like when you're creating stories yourself you can make them about anything and it's very very simple and easy to do that and it's very simple and easy to click with any topic that you're doing so we do lots of story swaps and put characters like the Gruffalo or traditional tales characters in and then children can send them to different settings and do different things with them and you can be very creative and create any story really but what I wanted to talk to you about today was really kind of those skills that I touched upon at the beginning and underbedding with that. So um, the first thing that we get a lot of feedback on is children's social skills. And it's about creating a safe space for children through storytelling where anything that they say is okay and goes. And we find that children, as they go up to school, they often become more wary about giving the right answer, which I think becomes something that restricts them in terms of really every area of learning. So if you're asking them to contribute and ask questions and be curious, you want them to have that safe space where they can be confident and they can be curious and they can give any answer and that's absolutely fine. So that's something that's really important to us with Tales Toolkit and something that with storytelling, when you do that in any area of the curriculum, it's about responding to whatever child says to you and going with that flow. Um, the other thing that we do, we do lots of problem solving. So it's a really obvious thing for us because we have the problem solution, which then comes into lots of different areas of learning. So it could be when you're doing experiments in science, you could be talking about, oh, we've got a problem. Let's think about the solution. And we do a lot of work where we say, well, let's think of three solutions and make one magic and let's talk through those. And I think with storytelling, when you're talking about different areas of the curriculum, it doesn't matter what story you're creating with the children. Children, it's about getting them to ask those questions, to think those things through, to talk about different endings and different outcomes and how those might work out, to create stories and then to be like, well, let's try that. Let's see if we can do it in a different way. So um, those problem solving opportunities are a really obvious link with storytelling and they link with maths, they link with science, they link with all sorts of different things. Um, the other thing we have is in terms of empathy, we do a lot of work with kind of thinking about feelings, um, talking about feelings, how characters might feel. We talk about kind of getting the children to show the expressions in their face and to act things out and to talk things through and to think about outcomes of, you know, what that might mean for a particular character. And then I think also with storytelling, what starts to happen with children is that they start to see that children 
in their class have a different story to them or a different idea. And I think it's starting to realize that others have different views and opinions to their own. Um, and the other thing, you can put anything in the kit. So we do a lot of work where we'll put children into the kit. So they become the characters in their own stories and they can go off and do things. And like, we've got one here, he's going to the farm. So it then kind of puts them in a situation when they can try out different things and put themselves into stories. And the other thing that we do is we'll take obvious baddies. So for example, here, you've got the fox becomes the character and Red Riding Hood becomes the problem. So what would be her side of the story and how was she feeling and how was he feeling and how would that play out a different way around with the same story? So we do a lot of work around empathy. Um, <clears throat> and I think then it's really for us with Tell's Toolkit, um, it's thinking about those social skills and giving them those confidence and that safe space and giving them the skills. So we give them the tools and the skills and the kit then to be able to build independence so that they can then go off and create those stories on their own. <clears throat> and I think, I mean, if you don't take tools, you might not have Tell's Toolkit in your school, but it's thinking about ways that you can facilitate storytelling and get children to become confident enough that then they can have those skills that they're doing it in their play, they're doing it in the playground, like you can kind of turn your back and they're creating stories on their own. <coughs> Sorry, I'm just going to take a drink. <laughs> and then the other thing that we've had, particularly this year, is we've had lots of stories where children have opportunities to discuss those big issues. And I think with COVID, this was one of the stories that came back from the school <coughs> where they said the characters were the family, the setting was the world, the problem was the germs and the solution were the doctors and the nurses and the key workers. And we created some illustrations for, <coughs> sorry, I shouldn't be coughing on this slide, should I? <laughs> um, um, but they had, um, we, we created some illustrations for people to be able to take away to create stories as well. And we've had lots of wonderful stories coming back. And I think it's that kind of safe space, again, that I've been talking about where children can explore big issues in a way that it doesn't necessarily relate to them, that it's relating to a character and story or somebody that's kind of outside of their space. And you see that all the time in story books that you read. There's lots of opportunity. But <coughs> Sorry, I'm going to take another drink. <coughs> uh, I'm talking too fast, I think. <laughs> um, so in terms of discussing big issues, I think through story, it's kind of giving them that third area where they can go away and really explore those big issues without it being personal to them. And we often find as well with schools that, um, that we say to kind of really clue up on your safeguarding policy beforehand, because you do often find children bringing up problems and things in stories that will be stuff that's going on for them at home. Um, in terms of communication and language, um, which plays into every kind of area of learning, like you can't do geography or maths or science or um, literacy or anything unless you've got those language skills underpinning what you're doing. So like that's got to be the core really of all learning for children. And what we do with storytelling is we're really playful with language. So it's about using song and rhyme and sound and funny voices and kind of really playing with stuff. And what you find as well is for those children that have got English as an additional language, you've got children with special educational needs, then it's kind of giving them the opportunity that they can just get involved with sounds or actions or kind of even if it's just holding part of a parachute or something that you're doing that they've kind of got that space to play with sound and that there's no pressure on them to have to commit to kind of full sentences and they can build up to that over time. So it's just really being playful. Um, and the other thing as well in terms of what we do and communication and language it's we think the most powerful thing is that it's given them something they're interested in. So like you can see here this little boy's written a story about bat jail and destroyer and this is for us I think the most powerful thing is that if you create that opportunity for them to explore stuff that they're really interested in, then that's where they're gonna run with the ideas and they're gonna give you the stuff. They're gonna ask questions, they're gonna be curious, they're gonna to commit to sitting down for a long period of time and wanting to write with you and they're gonna be excited about what they're doing. So I think it's that enthusiasm and thinking about how you feed that into all areas of the curriculum. And for us, like, 
like again if you're doing like your math stuff um it could be very simple in terms of like thinking about characters that you can pull into that and giving them then aspects of maths in terms of storytelling and feeding that into their stories um and then the other thing we say is take away the pressure so i think for a lot of children they feel that pressure um in terms of kind of like uh, like I'm just looking at the situation we've got here in terms of say writing to sit down with a teacher one to one and do a piece of writing like you can see here if you're making it fun you're creating a big space where nothing's wrong there's no pressure you know I haven't got like a blank piece of paper in front of you where you're going to get it wrong you're going to make a mess of it that that opportunity to be kind of playful and messy and that there isn't that kind of pressure on the child is really important and I think that's something that you can feed in right across um, and we say all the time as well is just think really carefully what your outcomes are and what you're trying to teach so um, if you're trying to teach fine motor skills if you're trying to teach children an aspect of science it's not necessarily about what they've written neatly in their books it's like really thinking about those outcomes for that child and taking away that pressure where you possibly can um, and then the last thing I want to talk about was creativity. So creativity kind of really feeds into everything. And we have a lot of feedback here in terms of children, like with their SATS results in Key Stage 2 in England, <coughs> that often what the problem is for them is that they have the skills in place, but they don't have that creativity to think outside the box. And they'll have a text in front of them, but they can't see past that to kind of dig in and find out what might be happening in the background to be able to answer those higher level questions. Um, and creativity is something that decreases over time often. So you'll find you'll go into early years and you'll say, well, what's this button at squash? And they'll be like, oh, that's, you know, Mr. Jones who likes to go to the moon or, you know, that's like, you know, Super Ted or whatever it is. As you'll go into a key stage two classroom and they'll be like, it's a squash. I, like what are you asking us so um, I think as they go up to school there's often that realization for them that there's right and wrong answers and they don't want to look stupid in front of their friends and they don't want to commit to something that might be the wrong thing so um, like it's really keeping those creativity levels as they go up through the school and you can see here we do a lot of work with any day objects kind of you know really kind of open-ended stuff can be absolutely anything and it's keeping those creativity levels going and also in terms of your open-ended kind of props like this that symbolic play is your early stages of literacy so that kind of this toothbrush is my cat in my story is the first stage of going right this word c-a-t like written on a piece of paper is representative of the word cat so that symbolic play is those early stages of literacy that then feed in so creativity is massively important and that comes into every area of learning and it's something that you want your children being curious and asking questions and without that like you can give them the knowledge but they're never going to go on to do that well unless you can give them those skills in place underneath everything and you can see here like children are kind of hardwired to do that anyway like there's films like cars where you know you've got characters that talk and they see characters and everything and I think even as adults we still do that I mean these are just a few examples where we look at them and I'm seeing the hat that's a face and like we start to see that kind of creative storytelling characters are in anything and that's something that we work with that anything can be a character in a story <coughs> Um, so just a little bit about Tells Toolkit to finish off. Um, we do do free webinars um, and we do free webinars with lots of top experts in the UK. So if you ever wanted to sign in and come along to one of those, if you look us up on social media, um, we advertise all our webinars on there and there's no cost at all. The live event is free and then all of the recordings are kept for our, our members. Um, but what we do with Tells Toolkit is quite a big package of stuff. So there's lots of online training and resources that come with that um, so if anybody wants any more information about that or wants to chat with us about that then feel free to get in touch um, and I've put a special offer on for the British schools in the Middle East and the people that are attending this webinar um, and I've put my contact details on there so um, I think I've done that within time ish <laughs> but yeah any questions that anyone would like to ask then I'm around to chat Thank you so much, Kate. That was amazing. Um, it was just really good to see those um, those issues that are more important now, as you said, with the whole COVID, with our social, you'll see kids 
with lots of gaps now because they were on the distance learning and as you said parents are working they can't be sitting with their children they're not trained teachers to kind of go through destructure stories in the way so Mm -hmm. this um such an amazing toolkit work toolkit sorry that you can use across the curriculum as you said for science and i really love that study that showed the problem solving links to gcse maths that was really interesting as well yeah Um, that was really great and just with especially in dubai as you said so i also taught in east london and hackney and there's very similarities with children with English as additional language so um, even you saying that they can connect through signs and actions I think that's ELL is always on my um, action plan each year I'm out here it's always an action plan to do and these are the kind of two kits that the kids need yes. to really get that language as it's a part of the word you know it's so important um, in all lessons and um, do you want to add anything there? Yeah, um, I know in terms of you know children with English additional language as well. I think sometimes uh, it's thinking about background culture too. So you can add things into those stories that will resonate with those children. So it can be things that are familiar to them from home. Um, you can do stories in home language as well, um, and we encourage home learning stories from families. Um, but then the other thing is it's thinking because I know in East London, when you're doing something like say Red Riding Hood, they might not have been to a forest. Um, they've got no idea what a wolf is like so who knows what a woodcutter is do you know what I mean there's a lot of that stuff that we take for granted that children know and they don't so um, I think it's by giving them that place to act things out and we find that with children with English as an additional language and low levels of language it's that combination of the word the action the prop the symbol everything comes together for them to start to make sense of ah oh, okay this is what a wolf is like I'm going to act it out I'm going to hear the noises I'm going to see the picture I'm going to link that that's the character in this tale so I think it's that combination of pulling all those things together that helps them to quickly develop those language skills so yeah lovely um so thank you so much Kate so we'll make a move on to Jackie who also has um, works for fieldwork education who will be making some links as well with the importance of language and communication so it's a really nice link in and we're going to look at how we can assess these use it for cross-curricular links um with different because as i said it's a part of the word it's that language vocabulary that you can very easily connect throughout the curriculum okay so jackie has more than 20 years international experience um has been a deputy head so she has a lot of experience will be able to tell us lots of information so Jackie, do you want to take it away then? Is Jackie, you're okay. Okay, hopefully I can share a screen and get a presentation up. Let's see what happens. Um, right, can you see the proper screen yet? No, not yet. Okay, hang on then. That means I've done it in the wrong order. Let's try it this way. I think whilst Jackie is just getting ready, um, I just want to apologise. I think a lot of you had the wrong link. Um, So what we usually do is we send out two links um, to the BSME and I think they accidentally sent you the the, the run through link. So uh, on behalf of us and the BSME, we do apologize. Um, I'm sure it's kind of like a panic moment for some of you, but um, we appreciate you were uh, jumping on board. Um, and I think Jackie, I think you're ready to go now. So I'll just put myself on mute. I'm still trying to get the presentation to show. It's the same issue we had the other day. Okay, can you see the slide now? Yes. Okay, excellent. Right. Well, hello, everyone. Um, As mentioned, I'm from the International Primary Curriculum, and I'll be talking to you about some of the ways that we kind of encourage teachers to integrate their language learning into thematic units. So we think that regardless of subject focus, language and communication skills are key to improving learning. Um, And what we'll explore is the receptive skills, so the reading, the viewing, the listening, and the productive skills, so writing, speaking, and presenting, that could be developed through thematic units. 
So first of all, I'll give you some kind of context just so you know where we're coming from. We have a series of thematic units and this is just a selection of them. We organize them into three age ranges so that they cover all the primary years from five to 11 years old, lots of different things. We don't actually have language arts as a driver for any of these units. We do have some things on myths and legends, but that then focuses more on the historical side. So these are the 10 subjects that are focused on within our units. Some units have all of these subjects in and some units just have one or two of them. And we do now actually have some single subject focused units where we have um, specific ones for art or for music and for PE as well to support our single subject teachers. So we do have learning goals for all of these. We also have learning goals for maths, language arts as well. And within our units, we do provide opportunities for ICT and computing, language arts and maths to be integrated. And obviously I'll be focusing on how we do language arts today. So the starting point when I was asked to do this presentation was to think about integration. And in the dictionary, it says to combine two or more things in order to become more effective. So one of the things we need to think about is when we're looking for opportunities, it's not just about going, oh, look, there's an opportunity and doing it. That might be the first thing we do, but then we need as teachers to reflect on that and say, was that an effective combination of subject learning and language learning? So we're going to think about some of the areas where we think that the language can come in. And I know that teachers around the world will have different perhaps language arts programs, but they're likely to include all of these three elements. So hopefully some of the examples I give will kind of be an inspiration for you to think about your own context for your subject learning, whether it be thematic or even if it be specific subject learning, as well as thinking about how your language program, how it might align and how you might be able to make some of those integrations a positive experience for your learners. The idea being that we can think about, OK, when we're trying to find out more about the world, we might do a science experiment. We might do some research online. So what kinds of literacy skills will we need to do this? And then when we think about productive literacy skills, we often ask for responses in subjects, but we don't necessarily offer the guidance to say, remember the skills that you learn in your English lesson. How will they help you here? Show me what you know about something. So hopefully there'll be some things there that show you how you can bring different parts of the curriculum together. So in the IPC, we really concentrate on knowledge, skills and understanding. So we have this idea of knowledge, which would be remembering things, developing skills, which are progressive. And we don't say there's a finish point. They just keep going. And then we also have um, the idea of developing a breadth and depth of understanding. So I'm going to focus on a little bit of knowledge, but then the main part will be about those literacy skills. So very briefly, vocabulary for us is a knowledge thing. This means you need to remember it. So when you're thinking about learning new words and things like this, you have to be able to remember them to be able to use them. And this is a bit of research that came from Hirsch, which says, you know, it's something that happens slowly. We know that in the, uh, the beginning years of the life that there are lots of opportunities to really get vocabulary. But when we start to think about academic vocabulary, then we have to start thinking about how can we really help that development happen? So he offered a key insight that if you actually put the word in a context, so the idea is that you're not trying to separate it and say, here's your list of science words that you're going to need for the upcoming unit. What he's saying is that it needs to be in that context. And what we think about is that for learning to happen, you need to make connections. So for us, we would always try and make sure that, that there are opportunities to learn and to use words that are subject focus, but actually help us further the way that we talk about learning and the way that we understand learning in those subjects. So we do recommend explaining a few critical words, but they need to be done in the context. So we provide a glossary. So this is one of the new things that's part of our units because we had lots of questions from schools about, well, how do I know which terminology the children need to be using? So we provide a glossary and we try and keep it focused because it should support the subject language learning so that they can use the correct terminology. But it's really so that it develops those communication skills. So learners can talk about what they have learned. 
they can ask questions about what they have learned and maybe what they want to learn more about. So if they have the words, they'll be able to communicate better, talk to each other, talk to the teacher, and they should be then seeing, hearing and using these words regularly so that they then become part of their long term memory. So if they do a science unit towards the beginning of the year, maybe they return to it towards the end of the year and look at some of the similar themes. Hopefully, because they've had such a broad base of experience with that vocabulary, it will be in their long term memory and they'll be able to retrieve it and use it again. So. This is a very simple start. Vocabulary is kind of one of the building blocks for what we use for language, but it doesn't require those skills that take long term development. This is something that you have to remember it, you have to know about it. But what we're going to think about next is what we might do with things. So the IPC has a process to facilitate learning. There are opportunities for communication at all of these times. Um, they require language, talking about things and doing things. However, we're going to focus on what we call our mini cycle of research, record and reflect. What happens in our units is these things are revisited time and time again. And I'm sure that you can think about what happens in your own subject or thematic learning where you might, instead of research, you might be doing inquiry, then you might be doing processing, and then you might be reflecting and moving forward. So hopefully some of the terminology is transferable and you can see how to use it in your own situation. So for research, I'll be connecting to those receptive skills, listening, viewing and reading. How do we get the information? However, receptive skills have to go beyond just getting the information. You have to understand the information that's being consumed so that you can do something with it. So then we have the record side of things, which are more of those productive language skills. So the speaking the presenting and the writing. And the emphasis on these may change depending on the level of language that the child has. It might change by age, but there should always be opportunities for all three of these things happening for everybody. So it goes beyond just that, you know, can I communicate? It's really got to be about that communicating effectively. Does somebody else know what I'm learning about? So we provide lots of opportunities where maybe a piece of writing is presented in a gallery or they have to read the piece of writing. Maybe they send a letter to somebody. The same with the presenting. We try and think of ways that there can be an audience for, say, the video that they've created so that then it gives it that stronger purpose and makes it more meaningful. Now, reflection for us does have many facets, um, but for the purposes of this presentation, I don't think it's the best context for developing those skills that we'll be having a look at. Um, yes, definitely based on communication skills. We don't want reflection to just be internal. We want it to be externalized so people can talk about it and think about where they'll be moving on to. But for the purposes of this, we'll focus on the research and record. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a few examples that have come from our units, but hopefully they're things that you can kind of look at and go, oh, yeah, I've used a technique similar to that. This is how I could develop it. Or I think there's an opportunity for that kind of learning to be embedded either within the subject or to be pre pre practiced within an English class and then taken into your subject or thematic learning. So hopefully everybody can make meaning. So the first one are receptive literacy skills. We'll look at viewing. So this is an example of a language arts goal from the IPC, be able to summarize and retell what they have viewed. There are probably similar ones in your own program. Sometimes they also put it under digital literacy skills as well. So that idea of when we look online, what kinds of things we look at, the different kinds of visual texts and things. So for us, when we talk about text, we try and think about it in the broadest sense. So the main focus of the task that we're looking at, remember, is the subject that's embedded within the thematic unit. These language arts learning goals are something that we hope would happen through the process. So you may have needed to teach some of the strategies and things first, and then you can transfer and apply them to this situation. Whereas in other times you might think, OK, actually, this is a good place to actually teach this because it brings more meaning to it. So with the first one, Videos have become quite commonplace in the classroom as a way of presenting information. We know that um, the learners that we have consume massive amounts, whether it be from YouTube or whether it be from um, their own kind of streaming services and things. So I want you to think about, do we actually teach children 
to consume what they're viewing, to actually process it and really do something with it. Because we sometimes expect, okay, children watch lots of TV, they must be able to watch a video and get the most from it. So I want you to imagine that you're with your class and you're watching a video on the life of Columbus or a significant person that you study from history. Now, often what happens is you watch the video, you talk about it, and this is largely a teacher led activity. I'm going to share a couple of examples of how you can shift that focus. You put the responsibility more on the learners and they are also learning a skill then for how they can consume other things that they view and hopefully be more thoughtful consumers. So the first one might be you have a group, you set up your group of four and assign A, B, C and D to the group and person A as they watch and listen to the video is going to note down any dates. Person B will think about places, person C will think about the people involved and person D would think about the events. The idea is that then you're bringing a focus to things so the children aren't trying to remember everything because on a single viewing the chances are that they won't. So as each child makes their notes, they could do it in pictures, they could do it in words, we could have numbers, they can make their notes and then at the end of the session, they can reconvene, share what they heard and what they saw, and then you may want to watch the video again to see if they can then make more sense of the story. But by doing this, you're teaching them a strategy that they might need to watch something more than once to make the most sense of it. They might need to choose what the focus is. If it's history, dates might be important. If it's geography, places might be important, but you can help them then actually develop their own strategies for consuming information. And a second example might be that you make pairs and one pair, person in the pair faces the video. One person can actually not look at the video at all and just concentrate on what is being said. So listening to the voice over the conversations, what the characters might be doing, because it could be a kind of an animation telling the same kind of story from Columbus. So the idea here is that what would happen is the pairs, they focus on their thing, either what is being said or what is being seen. At the end, they make their notes, they can draw pictures, they can use words, but they should note it down in their own way. Then they can swap roles. So you show the video again, and this time the person who was listening focuses on what's being seen. So here then they have the opportunity to bring their two senses together of listening and seeing to try and make more sense of their information. They can then combine their notes together and swap their ideas. And this then also introduces the idea of cross-referencing, checking in with someone. Did we both hear the same thing? Did we see the same thing? Because a single watching of a video, you can get sort of interpretations that are maybe not the correct ones. People maybe don't focus on the most important information. They focus on what the person was wearing rather than the place they went, for example. So that gives an opportunity for the children to combine their thinking and really then try and look at their new knowledge about the story that was being told. So another example, reading. Um, I'm sure that lots of different schools around the world and the people listening into this from the BSME, you might have structures what, that you follow for reading classes. You might be doing guided reading so many times a week. You might have some comprehension strategies that are required at different levels within the school. The idea is that I want to tell you how you can use some of those and apply them within your subject learning. So these again are just some examples of language arts goals. I'm sure you've got very similar ones. So these come from what we call milepost two, which is kind of our eight year olds. And you've probably got similar ones from the beginning, the middle and the end of your own programs to think about. So we have a lot of reading comprehension lessons within schools, but one of the things we need to think about is how we can create more meaning for that by teaching children that they need to use those techniques in other situations. So here's the first example. Inferring is quite a complex reading comprehension thing. It's going, it's going deeper, it's looking at the clues. And one of the things that we thought about is how the things that we read can actually pri provide a context for understanding things about the world. So this one comes from our Olympics unit. And if we think about it, the, how the role of women changed throughout the 20th century, how dress codes changed, whether they could go to work. This is reflected in some of the events, the Olympics being one of them, the shift in changes um, during wartime for the roles that maybe men and women had in the home and things like that. So by providing something to read, 
that's actually just within the context of your learning, for example, about the Olympics, you can go deeper and actually start to infer things maybe about the societal changes at the time. So this gives an example of actually how to use that skill of inferring to go deeper and to find out more about a subject area. This is another comprehension strategy determining an importance. Um, when you teach very exciting things that are all shiny and fun and they have foods in and they have flags in and there's fireworks and things like this, often we find that when we talk to children, the bits that they remember are not necessarily the most important bits that we want them to remember from the reading. So they read a story and they maybe it's a, a story of Diwali and they kind of go, oh yes, they lit candles, they had new dresses, they exchanged clothes. And while these social elements are important, we had a look at how we could try and shift the focus to determining the importance of what actually led to that celebration taking, taking place. So one of our activities is that the children read picture books that describe how children celebrate social and religious events. And what we want them to find the important bits are, are the things that actually connected to the origin event. So they'll have talked about the origin event beforehand, they might have watched a video, they might have listened to it, they might have interviewed somebody, but they know where that event has come from, but now they've got to start building those connections. And again, as we've said, that building connections is one of the important things for learning. So hopefully through this, the children will research and really get those important nuggets to do with the basis for the event, rather than just the fun bits that we know that they often want to concentrate on. And this is our final comprehension strategy one. Um, another strategy we know some schools use is the idea of connecting. So connecting text to self, text to text and text to world. We found that this kind of approach would work well with what we call our sustainable development challenge series. So this is around the sustainable development goals and it challenges children to think about themselves and the world and why these particular goals are significant to the world. So when we look at this, we can have children think about their own relationship with water. Do they have a consistent supply of water? Is their supply of water clean? So they can actually be thinking about themselves and then thinking, OK, well, how do I find out about other people? How do I think about what this means to the world? And in actually reading some of the resources provided um, by the UN around the Sustainable Development Goals, they can start to build up a picture of other people's relationships. And that might, depending where you are, that might be, oh, these people seem to waste a lot of water. These people seem to be inundated with water. Maybe they're in a flood area. So there are very different perspectives they might pull out from reading other people's stories and case studies. And then the third thing is the idea of sort of that using other kinds of text. So we think this is a good opportunity to bring in new stories. So then it's that idea of connecting the text that they've been reading around the issues of the sustainable development of clean water and sanitation and how those issues are still evident in the world today. And this provides a really good opportunity for teachers to bring things up to date, to make things local, because then that strengthens the connections that children make to their learning because they're going, oh, this is about me. This is a story that's near me, or this is a place that I know or a place that I visited, or this was yesterday. And it then makes hopefully their learning more meaningful. And finally, on the receptive skills is the listening and this idea of we tell children that they need to listen all the time. We're often saying you must listen, you must listen, but it's whether we can actually teach them to be better listeners. So it might be again using similar kinds of comprehension skills, that idea of, um, as Kate mentioned, the idea of being physical and actually engaging and responding to things because we know that that helps learning. So this is a simple idea that can be applied to any story that you're looking at. So you might have a story that you think is a bit dry and you're not sure how to make it interesting for the children. And you can have this kind of active theatre approach to it. So you can assign a movement, a noise, something that needs to be done when each of these things happen in the story. And by doing that, you're getting the children involved and they should have a better memory of the things that happened in the story so that that furthers their learning. So for example, in this case, it's more about kind of social learning. This was taken from a story where um, when Edward Jenner developed the smallpox vaccine, that's quite something that's quite difficult for a child to understand. You know, yes, this year they've heard a lot more about vaccines. It's perhaps making a little bit more sense to them, but by bringing these elements in, we would hope the children had have a better understanding of the story afterwards and they'd be able to talk about it because they'll remember parts of it. 
So we'll now quickly move on to productive literacy. And hopefully you can sort of recognize some of the elements again and think about how you transfer your English language learning into the other places. So we've been particularly focused on developing some resources around this so that cover our fiction, nonfiction, poetry and media. So we actually now have text type guides and we've actually been working on connecting those to our thematic learning. So if they're actually doing something within science, within geography, there might actually be a text type guide that is useful and that then provides a hint for the teacher to think, okay, what do I need to pre-teach? And then what can I then use in my thematic learning? So this is a very simple example. It's very structured. It's very scaffolded. So if we think about um, creating your own history museum in your classroom, maybe in this case, it's a, a toy museum where people bring in a toy and instead of presenting it and talking about it, we're going to say, OK, we're going to set it up as a museum and we need to know what kinds of things we need to say about it. So you can look at a real museum, what kinds of things are included, the name of the item, it might be where it was made, what it was made of. You decide on those and then just provide the structure. So this is a very simple scaffolded kind of thing, but there are a lot more complex texts that also can be used and embedded into that kind of recording and using our literacy skills then for subject. So have a think about all the different types of text that you can think of and then in your mind kind of think do you think of these as just English tools or do you think of them as subject learning tools so this is just a selection that we've come up with all different things and I'm going to pull out a couple of these and show you how we think they go beyond English and they can come back become part of other learning so this is an example from one of our units where they've been looking at their local history so one of the things they've done is they've learned about local people, how they're celebrating the locality. Do they have streets named after them? Are there commemorative um, plaques and things in different places? And then their challenge at the end is kind of to try and summarize this. So to show their history learning and to work individually to or in pairs to create a local history book. Now, one of the challenges that we find with writing is that children need to know the order they need to write in because the type of text often drives that. So there's lots of non-chronological -chron reports, lots of styles of doing it. Sometimes it might be sequenced by first, second, third, fourth to do with the time that something happened. In this case, the challenge for the children is to think about actually using the context of a walk around the locality to put their little pieces of writing in. So they're writing to describe and explain the purpose is very important. The context is that local history guide that you could give to someone so that they could walk around. And then the content comes from, they could choose, they might focus on transport changes, shopping, those people that have lived in the local area and things like that. But the important thing is, I think that we need to tell the children, look, you've learned non-chronological report writing. We know what it's all about. Now we're gonna take it out of our English lessons and we're gonna use it in a meaningful way. And this one is from our Freeze It unit and Freeze It focuses on science and geography. So it thinks about um, how things get cold, what are they like, but also places that are cold. So in this case, the idea is that they write a nonfiction travel guide. It's kind of a different kind of report. It's describing again, but this time it's describing places. So thinking about what they look like, what the weather is like there. And we've sort of kind of given a suggestion that they add in a don't forget to pack list. So it kind of makes it a bit more interesting. That provides you the opportunity then for a little bit more creativity, even though it's nonfiction, what other kinds of things could be included that tell us about those places. And by using these kinds of structures and really giving them the purpose, hopefully, again, the children can transfer those literary skills, literacy skills to a meaningful place. Um, this one is probably one that I'm sure has come up in most classrooms around the world, even though we know that the games that children might create now might be online games, they might be apps rather than necessarily the board games that we used to make, games need instructions. So the purpose to explain how to do something, but we've given a meaningful context where the child is the only one that knows what the instructions are and the rules of play are, which means they have to bring their communication skills, their literacy skills to explain it to other people. The other thing that we recommend with this is the chance to test. So if we think about 
you write, you test, you edit, this provides a really good opportunity for observing, can children use our instructions? Do they get a sense of those rules of the play? And if not, what changes do I need to make? Which brings a very, very meaningful writing and editing process, which can often be challenging when children don't want to edit and redo something again. And our final one, so this one is more focusing on the fictional, so thinking about a poem that describes an experience. Now, in this case, we don't say which type of poem it should be. If you've been looking in your class at haiku, then you could use haiku to describe the experience. In this case, it's um, following on from an art lesson where they thought about the signs and sounds of a firework display and tried to recreate that in art. If you've been looking at an acrostic, you could have different names of fireworks and do an acrostic. The point is that it's that other way of looking at the creativity around, I can create art that shows what I think about and know about and have experienced with fireworks, or I can use words to do it as well. So it's just providing those different kinds of opportunities. And it, it kind of helps different children be successful because they can see themselves in these kinds of activities. If they're particularly artistic, they might have enjoyed the art lesson. If they like playing with words, they might prefer doing it through poetry. Now, one of the points to think about, and I hope that some of those examples kind of resonated with you and think, oh yeah, that's actually easier than I think. Do remember that we're trying to look for effective integration. So you might start playing with your integrations and things like this, but for it to be effective, it needs to be planned, it needs to be thought out. And one of the things you need to plan is the assessment considerations. Sometimes as teachers, we present an activity to children. We say, okay, so we're gonna write our travel guide about our snowy place, and we're not clear on the most important expectations. Is the most important expectation that they create a good travel guide, that it has pictures in it, that it has captions, that they address these five issues as they go through their sequence of writing? Or is the most important thing that they understand and show us that they understand what activities, what the weather is like, how things change for people when they're trying to live or spend time in a snowy place? So is it that geography subject that we're looking at or is it the literacy that we're looking at? And we shouldn't do both. That's too much for children. We need to be able to be clear and say, this is my expectation. I'm really looking for, and we can decide, are we really looking for that transference of those literacy skills from English? Or are we really looking for, show me what you know and understand about geography. And you can make those decisions and use different opportunities, but look for the most effective ones. Uh, one final thought, I know that this is going out and most teachers teach English and you've been encouraged to share it in your schools, but have a think about the other languages, the languages that maybe children use at home, could they be used as part of research? Think about how additional language or host country language is taught in your school. Are there ways where they could actually integrate with the subject learning that's been happening? Could they be developing their vocabulary and then trying to apply that? For example, they might write, write a poetry in one of the other languages that they study. So don't just think about it from an English thing. If you can think about how to feed this forward to other teachers in your school, it might provoke some thinking for them as well. And it gives value to those other languages that the children are learning or that they have in their homes. So this is just a final slide. So if you want to find out more about us or if you have any questions, you can follow us in all of these different places doing all of these different things, or you can email to over at info at fieldworkeducation.com. Um, that was a very, very fast kind of run through. I know that there's a recording from this, so you can kind of pick through and have a look, but hopefully there are things where, that have inspired you and you can kind of think, yeah, I can see how to make that integration powerful, remembering to take the English language learning and putting it into your subject or thematic learning in a useful way. Thank you very much. Lila, you're muted. Hi, sorry. Um, thank you so much, Jackie. That was a fantastic um, presentation. Again, my page is full again with all notes that I can bring back to our school as head of English and what we can do. Um, I know I was visualizing myself as a teacher as you were going through, especially for like the research. So I would teach year two and for them to research. Sometimes that is a difficult um, task for them to do, but I love the breakup of the video tasks. Like we do a lot of Keegan work. So it kind of reminded me of giving the children jobs to do to kind of gather that information more meaningful and effectively. 
and also thinking about that assessment of effective integration I think that's really important because sometimes yet yeah, we can say oh it's great just to link that to science but to really understand why we're doing it which um, subject do we really want it to assess is it science is it writing which is going to be more effective so that was really really helpful and I'm sure everyone um, like me will have a lot to bring back and think about in their schools now so thank you so much for that Jackie. Carla do you want to add anything else about the presentations before I close? I just think uh, just what, what you guys are saying Marie, I just think it's What's really important is the fact that, you know, we need to make sure children are aware that English is everywhere and out of, you know, all the subjects, it's the one that we use every single day, no matter what we do. And um, I think from both um, both guest speakers, one thing that's really important is this um, the speaking side, which I think as children get a bit older, um, teachers tend to forget. So making sure that children are talking and, um, you know, discussing things before they actually think about writing anything down at all. And I think both uh, guest speakers were able to kind of get that message across as well. Um, so yeah, from me, thank you very much both. And if you want to just close um, it up. So thank you everyone for joining as um, Carla's taken a recording. So that can be, that will be sent to your schools. If you want to share it um, to the rest of your staff, that would be great. The guest speakers have also added their email addresses. So please ask them any questions or if you're um, interested in getting some of those projects in, in your school, um, the guest speakers are happy for you to email them. So please take that opportunity. Um, so our next um, presentation will be on assessment of reading and writing. So again, another really interesting topic, which we all um, will be doing in school at the moment, finding new ways um, to assess from a social distance. I know there has been a lot of chat in my school at the minute with the guided reading and listening to reading aloud. So I think that will be a really um, great presentation to tune into. So that will be the 18th of March. So keep that noted in your book. And also just to remind you of the English platform. I know I'll be going to a cluster meeting um, in a few weeks. So anything that comes up in my cluster meeting with teachers around Dubai, I will make sure to post any ideas that I've got from that. So again, if anyone else is going to any cluster meetings and you get some really good information, please just add it to the network um, platform where other teachers can share ideas. Um, but for everyone, Thank you very much for joining. Um, thank you to our guest speakers. That was amazing. Um, and I hope you all have a lovely day. And again, the video will be sent for your schools. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.